Hi, this is Steve at BlessedHopeForever.com. I'd like to talk a little bit about a subject that has always been of interest to me. Uh, it deals with the blood of Christ. It also deals with the ascension, or the ascensions plural, which may come as a surprise to some of you. And where the blood of Christ is now, and the three days that he lied in the tomb. The resurrection of Christ from the dead is the heartbeat of Christianity. It's mentioned at least 100 times or more in the New Testament. It was the highest note in any epistle's song, if you expressed it in musical terms. When we talk about the resurrection of Jesus Christ, we're talking about the keynote address of the Christian message. In replacing Judas uh, Iscariot, it was in order that he might be a witness with us of the resurrection. There's so much emphasis put on the crucifixion, and I don't mean to diminish that, but the resurrection of Jesus Christ was Peter's keynote in Acts where he says, This Jesus hath God raised up, whereof we are all witnesses. Acts 2.32 Filled with the Holy Spirit, the apostles with great power gave witness to the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. We know that from Acts chapter 4. When Paul went to Athens, the burden of his message was the same. It was the supreme importance of the fact that Christ did indeed rise from the dead. Acts chapter 17, as well as 1 Corinthians chapter 15, where that we read, If Christ be not risen, then is our preaching in vain, and your faith is also vain. If Christ be not raised, your faith and my faith is vain, and we are yet in our sins. Christianity in the main has adopted the crucifixion as the supreme icon. You know, we, we see crosses everywhere, from cemeteries to around our, from chains around our neck. But it, in early Christian art, it hardly appears. Early Christian art is concerned mostly with the ascension and the resurrection. The crucifixion loses its meaning without the resurrection. Without the resurrection, the death of Christ would have been insufficient. And I have preached on this, I don't know how many times, it was because Christ was raised that you and I were justified, that is, made righteous. With the resurrection, it is the atoning death of the Son of God. If you disprove, if you could disprove the resurrection of Jesus Christ, our faith is vain. But you'll never do that. To remain in the tomb would have proven that he, Christ was not who He said He was forcing us to conclude something about Him that was totally false, completely false. Why didn't God raise the Lord Jesus from the grave the very moment that He was laid within it? Or perhaps even the very moment that He died? Why the tomb at all? And why three days? Constant reference is made in Scripture to His having arisen on the third day, a fact that every Christian is familiar with. The Lord Himself emphasized this Himself on a number of occasions, as Paul did. So why three days in the tomb? Not one, not two, but three days. There's always been a very widespread belief that the spirit of man does not immediately leave his body when he dies. The Aborigines, they held that the spirit didn't leave the body until the sun went down. 
even though death had occurred first thing in the morning. In the Bronze Age, the Greeks, well, they believed that the spirit remained in or about the body until the body began to decay. And the Aztecs, they held that the spirit remained for four days in or about the body. Now, in the Old Testament, a man defiled by contact with a corpse was to purify himself on the third day. That's Numbers chapter 19. And the flesh of the peace offering was not to be kept beyond the third day. They believed quite widely that the spirit could be persuaded back into the body and the individual revived under certain circumstances up to but not beyond the third day. If you look at the traditions that were held, uh, traditions, tradition held that mourning for the dead should culminate on the third day because after that the spirit would not return. The relatives, the, uh, the friends of the deceased, were in the habit of going to the grave up to the third day so as to make sure that those that were laid there were really dead. The rabbis were in the habit of referring to Hosea chapter 6, verse 2, where it is written, After two days will He revive us, and the third day He will raise us up, and we shall live in His sight. seems apparent to me that if God had raised up Jesus Christ any sooner than three days, the Jewish people as a whole might have argued and would have had a right to argue that, well, He was never really dead. Even in the minds of the disciples themselves, there would have been some doubt. That may have been why the Jews never did argue that Jesus was not dead. They never really did argue that. All that they pretended to believe was, well, it was that someone had stolen his body. Matthew chapter 28. In John chapter 4, we read about how that the Lord restored to health a young child who was at the point of death at the point of wasn't dead but just at the point of death and Jesus healed him and he didn't die in Mark chapter 5 a child dies while the Lord was on the way the Lord was delayed the child could not have been dead but a short time before he arrived and he raises her from the dead and then in Luke chapter 7, the raising of the widow's only son. And in this case, the young man was being carried out to be buried. So he must have been dead for quite some time. The Lord approached. A young man, I say unto thee, arise. And, and he who was dead sat up and began to speak. Now a careful reading of these three accounts reveals the impression which was made upon those who were witnesses to these events or those who heard about them. In John chapter 4, close to the end of the chapter, we're told that the immediate household was so impressed that they believed on Jesus. In the second instance, in Mark chapter 5, we read where that the people were astonished with great astonishment. Now, it was remarkable enough to restore someone on the point of death, you know, just by a spoken word. It was more remarkable, even still, when somebody who was to all intents and purposes dead was restored to life with equal ease. 
In the third case, the young man had been dead long enough that he was actually being carried out for burial. And the impression made by his restoration to life was even greater. Isn't that amazing? I have no doubt, I have zero doubt that some of the Jews at least thought that in no way were these individuals really, really dead. It wasn't, in their minds, it wasn't conclusive evidence that Jesus had absolute power over death. What was yet, in their minds, what was yet required was one instance in which the dead was dead by all the standards of their traditional faith. That is, a restoration to life of someone who was known to have been dead for, you guessed it, at least three days. And so, so we come to the fourth incident, the raising of Lazarus. John chapter 11. It's there in John chapter 11. It's there and nowhere else that Jesus finally demonstrated that He was, in fact, the Lord of life itself. Jesus' companions, knowing that Jesus had learned that a beloved friend, Lazarus, was very, very ill, naturally expected that He would immediately make the journey to the home of where Lazarus was. But when he had heard that he was sick, he abode two days in the same place where he was. Now that wouldn't be normal in our experience. You know, to delay going to the help of a friend that we loved In the case of Lazarus, it was because of our Lord's delay that Lazarus died and was buried and, and had actually lain in the grave for more than three days by the time that Jesus had arrived. Now naturally, Mary, well, as you know, she didn't much like the Lord's delay. She said, well, Lord, if thou hadst been here, my brother would not have died. He doesn't really, he doesn't reply to her, just shares her grief. And then he asks her where Lazarus was laid. And then coming to the grave, he commands them to take away the stone. Martha, as you know, states that he's been dead four days. Four days. And Jesus cries, Lazarus, come forth. Now I'm quite certain that there were others named Lazarus who might also have come forth, including the Lazarus in Abraham's bosom, but they didn't. Only Lazarus. The Lazarus that we know. Now the effect of this upon those who witnessed it was absolutely stunning. Curiously enough, the real effect is witnessed by the Pharisees' confession. When we read John chapter 12, an interesting statement, John 12, 19, Perceive ye how ye prevail nothing. Behold, the world is gone after him. This is what the Pharisees said. This exclamation had direct reference to the fact that Lazarus had been raised from the dead. The raising of, of Jairus' daughter was wonderful enough. The raising of the widow of Nain's son was, was even more dramatic. It was even more extraordinary. But the raising of Lazarus was the last straw. It was the final proof. And that these events took place in this order is not, not an accident. The Lord remained for three days in the tomb for a very good reason. 
and that is, I believe, to dispel any argument, to squash any argument which might have been raised by the Jews that Jesus could never be the sacrificial Lamb of God because He may have never really died at all. Now, I've mentioned this in past videos, and uh, I think especially back in 2018, 2019. How were these three days reckoned? Well, the Jewish people did not reckon days in the precise way that we normally do. Us Westerners. You know, this has been clearly set forth in some of their own commentaries uh, on the Scriptures. Any part of a whole period of time in their way of reckoning could be counted as though it were the whole. A part of a day may be counted as a whole day. A part of a year could be counted as a whole year. And furthermore, a part of a day or a part of a night may be counted as a whole night and a whole day. I suspect that in the Lord's parable of the man who paid his laborers for a whole day, whether they had worked for a whole day or not, we read about that in Matthew 20. I believe that to be a reflection of this principle. The portion of a day is as the whole of it. The word uh, day, the word ona, on, ona, which is a word which occurs in late Hebrew, means simply a period of time. We have a teaching by rabbis between A.D. 80 and A.D. 100. Uh, one, in fact, who is descended from Ezra, which says, he, sa he says, a day and a night are an ona, and the portion of an ona is, is as the whole of it. This is how the Jews reckon days. Now, even more extraordinary to our way of reckoning is the fact that if a king has reigned for even the smallest fraction of a year, He's credited with a whole year's reign. Under certain circumstances, we make use of the same principle. We, in fact, do that. For example, if a baby is born and the birth is registered as being a few minutes before midnight on New Year's Eve, well, the parents can claim a dependent for the whole of the, of the year which is a year which is soon to end. And ministers are, are sometimes asked to perform weddings on New Year's Eve so that they gain the financial advantage of married status for a year that is already 99.9% .9 over. Now with this background, then, we could reconstruct the events of those three crucial days. That our, that our Lord laid in the tomb. Now we have one aspect of the resurrection which seems to me to have tremendous theological importance, even though uh, many don't uh, uh, seem to want to pay any attention to it. For this, we need to put together four passages of Scripture. Four passages of Scripture which seem in a special way to be related. The first of these is found in John chapter 20. Mary Magdalene had come to the tomb very early on Sunday morning while it was yet dark. And she found to her surprise that the stone had been rolled away. As the story goes on to tell, she immediately runs to tell Peter and John that someone had removed the Lord's body. Peter and John, they, they ran together to the tomb, John getting there first, but hesitating about entering in. While Peter, you know, we know kind of how Peter was. 
Peter coming up behind him, ran straight on in. Sounds like something that Peter would do. And then these disciples went away again unto their own home. Apparently, fully convinced that Jesus was not there, but not realizing that He had really raised from the dead. Meanwhile, Mary had arrived back at the tomb and stood there, overcome with grief and perhaps a little bewildered. Uh, scripture records what followed in John chapter 20. Mary stands outside the tomb weeping, and as she wept, she stooped down and she looked inside. And she sees two angels in white sitting, one at the head, the other at the feet where the body of Jesus had lain. And as you know, the story goes, they, they say unto her, Woman, why are you weeping? She said unto them, Because they have taken away my Lord, and I know not where they've laid Him. And when she had said this, she turns around and she sees Jesus standing, but she didn't know that it was Jesus. And Jesus says unto her, Woman, why are you weeping? Who, who is it you are seeking? And she, supposing him to be the gardener, said unto him, Sir, uh, if thou have borne him hence, tell me where thou hast laid him and I will take him away. And Jesus said unto her, Mary, and she turned herself and, and, and said unto him, Rabboni, which means teacher. She recognizes him. And Jesus said unto her, Touch me not, touch me not, for I am not yet ascended to my Father, but go to my brethren and say unto them, I ascend unto my Father and your Father and to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene came and told the disciples that she had in fact seen the Lord and that He had spoken these things unto her. Listen, the Lord did not allow her to touch Him. Verse 17. So, why deny Mary Magdalene at this time what He, Jesus, invited the other disciples to do later in Luke chapter 24? Well, in reading down through the commentaries, it's, it's often argued that there was a, a particular close attachment on the part of Mary Magdalene to the Lord and that it was this attachment which the Lord was forbidding her to give expression to because He now bore a different relationship to uh, all of His disciples. But it seems to me to be clear from the Lord's words that He meant something much more significant. He says, For I am not yet ascended to My Father. So, I have to ask, in what way could His ascension to His Father refuse to allow those who loved Him to touch Him? Or allow Mary Magdalene to touch Him? The words are meaningless unless one assumes that after He had once ascended to His Father, such personal contact would then be allowable. This indicates that after the ascension to His Father, He would come back to the disciples in such a form that is bodily, as to be accessible to them in this sense. So the use of the word ascension there in that text cannot logically be equated with His ascension into heaven at the end of the 40 days. 
though many translations assume that it does by giving a reference at this point to the ascension. I think we have a clue as to the significance of the Lord's words and the fact that He instructed Mary to go and tell the disciples, my brethren, as the Lord so beautifully puts it, that He was about to ascend unto, as He said, your Father and to my God and to your God. It seems to me important to note that on three occasions, at least three, Jesus referred to His Father by the title God. The first of these occasions is in Hebrews uh, chapter 10, verse 7, where we are given a glimpse of the events that took place at the very instant when the Lord entered into the little baby which Mary bore and actually became a part of our world of time and space. The, uh, what you might call the moment of incarnation. In verse 5, the announcement is made in heaven that when, when He cometh into the world, He saith, Sacrifice and offering thou wouldst not but a body hast thou prepared me. And in verse 7, then said, I, lo, I come to do thy will, O God. The second occasion was at the time of the crucifixion when darkness fell upon the world and all of our sin was laid upon Him which was the time of the fulfillment of Hebrews chapter 10, verse 7, when the Lord cried out, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? So we have two occasions recorded in which both clearly imply a special relationship between Jesus Christ and His Father, in which the crucial factor was not one of love and sonship, but one of judgment. In the first, the Lamb was offering Himself as a sacrifice, addressing Himself to God as judge. And in the second case, he is again appealing as the Lamb being sacrificed not to His Father, but to His God. And in the third case, the Lord is evidently still seeing Himself in two roles. He's now fully rest restored to fellowship with the Father. But, but, dearly beloved, listen, He has yet to present before God as the sacrificial Lamb some essential symbol of the completed sacrifice which is which was his blood in the old testament the temple as you know in the temple ordinances after making the sacrifice on behalf of the people according to the law of moses the high priest took some of the blood which was the proof of death and entering into the Holy of Holies, poured it upon the Ark of the Covenant, which contained the two tablets of the law. This was practical acknowledgement of the fact that God's law had been broken and that an innocent sacrifice of life had been made in recognition of the penalty, we know from the New Testament that these mosaic institutions were symbolic. They were shadows of a, a heavenly reality. This reality is outlined in some detail in Hebrews chapter 9. 
the last two verses of this passage read that it was therefore necessary that the copies of things in the heavens should be purified with these, but the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these. For Christ has not entered into the holy places made with hands, which are the copies of the true, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God for us. Dearly beloved, I am convinced that when Mary Magdalene encountered the Lord, He was, as high priest, about to ascend to the Holy of Holies in heaven to present His blood not only before His Father, but before His God and the God of His brethren. And to have touched Him at that moment, well, it would have been an act of desecration. This ascension then was not the ascension which occurred 40 days later when He passed out of visual contact with His disciples. Shortly after, in what seems to have been a matter of hours, He then appears to the disciples and this time, he didn't have the slightest hesitation in, in allowing them to handle Him. In fact, He invited them to do so, to see that it really was He bodily who stood in their midst. And to prove His real identity, He said, we read this in Luke chapter 24, Behold, My hands and My feet that it is I myself, handle me and see, for a spirit hath not, a spirit hath not flesh and bones as ye see me have. Note that the Holy Spirit does not use the accepted phrase uh, in the New Testament uh, for a living person, namely uh, flesh and blood. In the Old Testament, it's common to find the phrase. Uh, flesh and bones, a phrase that is used to indicate blood relationship. Uh, the Holy Spirit omits the word blood, so the body uh, which the Lord now presented uh, to the disciples uh, in the upper room, and uh, pres presumably Mary Magdalene was one of them at, at that time, was a body in which the life-giving principle, namely the blood, upon which we, you and I, are dependent, was no longer present. In some way, the Lord had changed. Not just because blood was no longer the source of life, but because His blood had been presented in heaven as an everlasting memorial of a full, perfect, and sufficient sacrifice made on our behalf. The beautiful thing about this to me is that a significant change had taken place in the Lord's resurrected body. So, we are being quietly told that a change had taken place in the form, the constitution, the makeup of the Lord's body between His appearance to Mary Magdalene and then in all of those to whom He appeared to afterwards. It seems then that, that Mary Magdalene found Him as He was about to present His blood. The symbol of of His death on our behalf before God's presence as judge in heaven. In some way, this act of presentation changed the makeup, the, the constitution of His body from 
from flesh and blood and bone to just flesh and bone, which was a real change in form. Mary was the only one, I believe, who saw him in that form which he bore immediately after the resurrection. All of the others, which and I believe would have included Mary at that time, Magdalene at that time, all the others saw him in that form which he bore after he had presented his blood in heaven. And we are told, we are told, you and I are told that we now constitute His church. We are members of His body, of His flesh, and of His bones. Ephesians 5.30 Go back to the uh, Old Testament system of temple worship in the Day of Atonement. You know, when the priest had carried the blood of the sacrifice into the Holy of Holies, those that were present there, they must have waited breathlessly to, to learn whether the, whether the sacrifice had been acceptable. The signal of God's acceptance was that the high priest reappeared from the Holy of Holies alive. For as the bearer of an, of an unworthy sacrifice into the, the very presence of God, he would he would otherwise have been judged unfit to live. Therefore, the reappearance, the reappearance of the Lord Jesus Christ alive after presenting His blood was and is our final assurance that His sacrifice is, is indeed full, perfect, and sufficient. Dearly beloved, rest in Him. For we have truly been made complete in Christ.